Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone to the First Nations Information Session on Marine Emergency Response. Uh, my name is Casey LaRochelle. I'm zooming in from Sanaimo territory where I live, work, and play. And I'm uh, from the Heisla Nation uh, Kitimat Band. Happy to be supporting this workshop. The workshop is being recorded like they are and we will provide a link to the um, information session playlist on YouTube for those that want to watch it. And we'll also make available any of the presentations um, that are shared with us. So I'd like to start off like we usually do um, and go around my screen. I'll call upon people if you could just briefly explain your position within your community. Um, expectations of that you have about emergency uh, uh, marine management. So with that being said, I'd like to uh, call people on screen. Cam Challenger, you're, you're first on my screen. <laughs> right on. Thank you, Casey. Uh, I'm Cam Challenger from Holistic Emergency Preparedness and Response, uh, coming to you from the traditional territory of the Tanaha Nation in the south uh, east corner of uh, BC. Uh, we work with nations all across BC, the Yukon, uh, and recently into Manitoba. Um, and uh, with that, uh, Crown Indigenous Relations and EMCRs, with the invite out to different things like that, um, to be here. I'm actually really looking forward to this and got on early. It was like, make sure I didn't want to get in here. Um, uh, expectations, uh, I'm here because I don't know a lot about marine response at all. Um, so if I can transmit that information or point people in the direction of finesse, uh, happy happy to do so. So just trying to take notes and be a sponge. So thank you. Thank you, Cap. Uh, Brigham Smith. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Brigham Smith. I work for Couch and Tribes in the Emergency Service Department. My primary role is an oil spill response coordinator for Couch and Tribes. Um, I've been with Couch and Tribes for about six months. Um, kind of the expectations of this meeting, I'd be looking to collaborate with the surrounding nations and uh, federal government uh, to improve our response capabilities in and around the Couch and uh, territorial waters. Thank you very much. Uh, Michelle Jacobs, Vanessa. Good afternoon, Michelle Jacobs with the decision support team as a technical trainer just checking in and wanting to learn some things about marine thank you thanks uh crystal aikman hi good afternoon i am calling in from couch and valley i work with the canadian coast guard and i'm a search and rescue officer so any questions regarding that i am here to answer thank thanks. you very much um cynthia johnston Hi, folks. My name is Cynthia Johnston. I'm the manager for the spill response team within DFO, the non-CCG part. Um, so here to provide a little bit of information, hopefully make some connections with folks and some action items and follow-up steps. Okay. I see in the chat, Albert, that you can't hear anything. Can everyone else hear, uh, hear just fine what people are saying? Yes, I can hear. Thanks, uh, Albert, I wonder if you've hit uh, mute um, by accident. That's all that I can think of. And I've I've done it myself plenty of times. Um, James from Diddy Dad. Hi, uh, James Fothergill Brown here, the emergency services coordinator for Diddy Dot First Nation. Um, tomorrow I'm bringing our uh, emergency response boat to get repairs in Lake Cowichan, um, specifically for oil spill response, um, as well as uh, attending to situations on the water. Um, upping the ante on our marine response is definitely a priority, um, because despite there not being any fatalities related to uh, flooding fire, there have been a number of fatalities on the water over the last uh, several years in NITNET. So this is a pretty big priority for me. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for hosting. Thank you, James. Sarah Hughes. Good morning, Sarah Hughes from the Canadian Coast Guard Marine Environmental and Hazards Response Team. I'm the Deputy Superintendent of Preparedness here, so my team do response planning. We also do some response. Um, so I'm here to give you some initial information, but happy to hear what other questions exist and how we can come and 
talk to individuals or a smaller group again about a specific issue that's more than um, within our realm of the possible. Um, and James, I have a memory of Nitnat, uh, Nitnat. Uh, as a child, my father was driving a truck and it the tire uh, broke and there was, we ran out of gas and we got stuck on the side of the roads, but it's a very beautiful area if I remember correctly, um, which I'm sure I do. So uh, looking forward to hearing more about what people would like to know about. Sorry, I didn't mean to overshare. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Jamie Galt. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jamie Galt. I'm the manager of response for the Environmental Emergency Program at the Ministry of Environment uh, for the provincial government. And I'm located here in Victoria, the traditional territories of the Squamish, uh, correction of the uh, Songhees and Squamish uh, First Nations. Certainly a pleasure to be here today. I will be providing a background on uh, the provincial spill program and specifically our program and how it relates to uh, the marine response to pollution events or spill events. Okay, thank you, David. And before you present, um, you're coming in pretty patchy on your microphone, so uh, I'm not sure if you have an alternative or not. Uh, David Carson. Good afternoon, everyone. David Carson from Land Force People. I'm looking to learn a little bit more about marine uh, emergency response than I already know. Thank you very much, David. Uh, Wayne Enright. Hi there, everybody. Um, Wayne Enright. <clears throat> Excuse me, I got a frog in my throat. Uh, I'm with the uh, Canadian Coast Guard uh, Marine Environmental and Hazards Response. Um, Sarah is my boss. Uh, I'm a planning officer. So uh, I'm here just to see what you guys are talking about. And if I can be of any assistance, uh, absolutely, I'm all ears. Thank you. And for the presenters on here, if you could consider putting your name and position and uh, emails in the chat for others, that would be helpful. Uh, Tully Wiseman. Good. Oh, I got it. I think I got it here, Casey. I'm working on it. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tully Waisman. I'm the uh, Emergency Planning Response Manager for Cowich and Tribes. Um, looking forward to this afternoon, and I've asked Brigham Smith to uh, speak on our behalf as the oil spill coordinator uh, this afternoon. So uh, thank you, uh, Casey and everybody for participating. Look forward to the session. Thank you, Tully. Uh, Fred, the E with a three. Fred. I think Fred's a bot, Casey. Okay. You're probably right. Um, Yannick Lapierre. That's okay. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Yannick Lapierre, I work for Indigenous Service Canada. I'm one of the program advisor on Vancouver Island and coastal uh, region. And uh, I'm interested to know how the spill response has uh, evolved since I left it about two, three years ago. Thanks. Good to have you here, Yannick. Uh, Grace Timney. Yeah, thanks, Casey. Good afternoon, everyone. Grace Timney, I'm the Emergency Program Coordinator for Slaywitch's Nation. Um, I also am very lucky to be a um, search and rescue volunteer on the Slaywitch's Squamish and Musqueam waters here. So. Personally and professionally, very interested in this topic. I'm looking forward to hearing what other folks are doing in this area today. And I also hope to have a bit better understanding of the funding options um, for this work and for spills, land and water through the different jurisdictions that be. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Howard Vroon. Oh, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, everybody. I'm Howard Froon. I'm the environmental liaison for the Heisla First Nation in Kitimat. And I'm really interested in this subject as we're right here in Ground Zero and LNG Canada's facility that is going to be ramping up here shortly. And I find it interesting to really want to collaborate and meet like-minded individuals so we can all work together to ensure the uh, health safety of our environment in the area. Thanks. Thanks, Howard. Great to see another high slow here. Uh, Willie Moon. 
Good afternoon. My name is Willie Moon. I'm from the Jaladino First Nation, Kinkamillet. I am the emergency manager coordinator for our nation. I just started this position three months ago. I'm interested in the marine stuff. Uh, uh, we live in a remote, isolated community, and we don't have any of that spill stuff and all of that. So I'm interested in that, and I'm hoping we, I can connect with uh, some of the Coast Guards who can help us, assist us with getting trained in that. Thank you. Good to see you, Willie. And if you pop your name and email in the uh, chat, I'm sure one of the Coast Guard people can reach out to you. Monica oh, yeah. Short. Hi, everyone. My name is Monica Short. I am a stewardship planner for the Kadizuhihe's First Nation. Um, about half my time is working in the marine planning realm uh, on some shipping and marine response work. Uh, so, yeah, just interested in hearing about what is going on with other nations. Um, yeah, great to be here. Thanks. Thank you, Monica. Grant Mayers. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Grant Myers. I am the Emergency and Safety Manager for Musqueam Indian Band, I'm also a member. Um, we live right on the mouth of the Fraser River, so definitely interested in, the, interested in the topic and interested to hear about the funding opportunities that come with it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Grant. Uh, Bob Mills? Sorry, Casey, got to find all the buttons. Good afternoon, everyone. Bob Mills. I'm the manager team leader uh, for the administration and strategic partnerships with First Nations Emergency Services Society. And I'm originally from Skidigat, Haida Gwaii. And I'm here actually just to listen to what the needs of the communities are in relation to marine uh, emergency response and help find some solutions. Thank you, Bob. Caitlin Minvia. Hey, Caitlin Minville, uh, EPC for Social Out First Nation. I know next to nothing about marine response and would like to find out a bit more. Uh, we have a fisheries program here and I was curious how the two might align. And yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you, Caitlin. Albert Nicknacken. Hello, everyone. I'm calling from Hacklip, Lillewood, just outside of Lillewood, BC. I don't know if we'll have anything to do with flood but spills were are definite because we're right by railways and it's a pretty big hub for uh to get to cash creek and that so anything anything i can learn and absorb and gain from this i'm looking forward to it thank you albert uh ian cunnings hi good afternoon everyone uh ian cunnings uh i'm the senior Director for Regional Operations at uh, uh, EMCR, Emergency Ma Management and Climate Readiness, here at the province, and uh, very grateful today to be calling in uh, uh, on the uh, Coast Salish lands here at uh, Green Timbers, and looking forward to uh, providing a bit of an overview on what EMCR can bring to the table. Thanks, Casey. Good to see you, Ian. Santana Edgar. If you're available, Santana. And we could circle back. Allison Lohman. Hello, Allison Lohman from Finesse. Um, I'm with the preparedness department, uh, specializing mostly in emergency plans and action plans, and here to listen. And if anyone needs to reach out, I'll put my email in the chat. Thank you, Allison. Terry Kish. Hello, my name is Terry Kish, and I am speaking to you from the unceded territories of Haida Gwaii, for the Haida. Uh, I am the emergency services manager for Old Masset, and we've got a lot of work going on right now uh, in the village, and part of it has to do with our marine response. We were just uh, unanimously voted into the Auxiliary Coast Guard, so we are now the ninth nation for that. I'm just waiting on uh, approval for funding for our boat. Um, also, Transport Canada has approached us in the last week, I believe, regarding spill response to here. And I do have some concerns with Haida Gwaii and all the vessel traffic that has picked up around us. 
we don't have a lot of resources on Haida Gwaii to do this. So I'm looking into how we can. Hello. Thank you, Terry, and uh, congratulations for all that great work. Hello. Have a good Har team. Carly Butterfield. Good afternoon, everyone. Carly here. I'm with the Canadian Coast Guard in preparedness for the Marine Environmental and Hazards Response. Uh, just hoping to sit in on the conversation today and uh, part of Sarah Hughes' team. So interested for her to speak here today as well. Thanks. Thank you, Carly. Uh, Rita C., and my apologies, I, uh, I'm not quite sure how to say your last name. Oh, hi, it's Rita Chamakala here. <clears throat> I'm a, sorry, excuse me. I'm a senior planner in preparedness with uh, the South Coast area. I work with Canadian Coast Guard and I work for Sarah. Thank you very much, Rita. Uh, Santana Egger, are you able to briefly introduce yourself? Hi, sorry, I couldn't get my mic off or my mute off for a second there. Um, good afternoon, Santana Egger from the Kirisukekes Nation. I am the uh, Marine Planning Coordinator for our stewardship office. Um, excited to hear what's going to be shared today. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Uh, before we ask Cowichan tribes to start their presentation, has anyone not had a chance to introduce themselves? Maybe just raise a hand or if you're on the phone, chime in. And I think we've covered everyone. Um, Brigan, I'd like to introduce you and uh, you could uh, describe your presentation and uh, we're looking forward to learning. Thanks, Casey. Uh, hello, everybody. So again, my name is Brigham Smith. I'm the Spill Response Coordinator for Couch and Tribes. Um, we've gone through a bit of a transition at Couch and Tribes and created a an emergency service department. Uh, previously, our spill response was looked after through our lands and marine team. Uh, now we work collaboratively with them to try and improve everything as far as the overall spill capacity goes for Couch and um, Right now, we're more of a building phase. We have purchased a few items as far as spill response equipment goes, but ongoing training is definitely something that uh, we need to continue doing. We do have a 26-foot travel trailer stocked with uh, containment boom, absorbent pads, etc., for deployment in and around couch and waters. Um, the majority of that uh, would be for the Couch and Bay Area. We also have two sea cans stocked with contractor containment boom, about 3,400 feet of that containment boom. Uh, where we're at a crossroads right now is we need a vessel that's large enough to deploy that boom. Deploying it's one thing and recovering it and then dealing with the disposal process of any of the uh, contaminants that we do collect would be a bit of an issue. So, uh, between the trailer and the sea cans, um, we have a capacity to do an initial response. Uh, right now, we have a uh, oil spill response guide that uh, myself and my coworker Paula Proctor, or sorry, Paula Lash, had developed. That's sitting with uh, upper management right now to decide when and actually we would deploy. The big question for us is: once a spill comes in or a notification of a spill what do we do with it? Right now we have assessment capabilities through flying a drone to assess with our marine team, um, our one vessel, the Sumqua, which is recently Transport Canada certified for assessment, but deploying the equipment that we have is a bit of an issue for us right now. Um, we need to figure out when we would deploy it compared to when we would get a tasking number from CCG and they deem it a spill that's recoverable. So the desires of the community in Couch and Tribes and the membership uh, doesn't always align with um, what the Coast Guard's uh, spill reporting line would deem as a recoverable type of event. So that's something I'm hoping to uh, collaborate more with uh, CCG on and um, Finesse for that matter, uh, if we're talking about vessels. Um, other than um, the equipment we have, you know, we have uh, the one vessel that's out on the water with a crew of three. 
the issue with the boat also is they're out in the water, but they're probably tasked with other events going on or other things. They're doing core sampling. They're doing marine assessment. They could be long ways away from where a spill were to occur. And for them to have to come back, us to load whatever type of equipment we have on board the vessel and then deploy it, there could be a substantial delay. So we're looking at that zero to six hour window, which is kind of the mandate for, I believe, CCG and WCMRC, the contract company, to respond to a spill. Um, we have tried to source out a landing craft. Uh, that's kind of in the wind right now. We're not sure exactly where that's going with, but uh, funding was an issue. So that's something we'd be looking to partner with other agencies to move forward for that initial window of response in our territorial waters. Um, notification process, what we generally utilize, um, we created an email address specific for spill. So it's spill response at couchandtribes.com. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the email notifications come through from any notification that CCG has on their Western, uh, Western Canada notification. And then we have the alertable app also through um, web access. So okay. between those two, that's how we get the bulk of the notifications and they pile up in. So we'll get notifications for areas like Kitimat or Okanagan Lake. I have to filter through those to decipher which ones would be ones we would want to probably go out and have a look at. A lot of them are just not in our area, not in our area, and we disregard. So streamlining that process would be nice. We also get some notifications locally through residents that would phone us directly or our vessel, which is out patrolling around in the water, doing their different activities throughout the day, and they'll notice like a sheen on the water, and they'll report it to us either send their drone up and take photos, and then we'll relay that back to CCG and come up with an action plan if it's uh, something that should be recovered or not. The other issue that we wanted to talk about was uh, river response, freshwater planning. I think maybe James and Nitnat, this would probably fall into your umbrella also. Um, we do have containment boom, river containment boom, but the means and the expertise to deploy that is something we will need some assistance with. Actioning that, you know, over the Christmas break, as an example, we had a vehicle go into the water, which potentially was contaminating the Cowichan River with oil and gasoline. But for us to contain that would have been next to impossible. A, we have the boom, but we don't have the personnel to do it. And we don't have the swift water training expertise to deploy that boom. And what do we do with it once we recover it? So those are kind of the stop gaps of where we are with the program, you know, six, five and a half, six months into it. Um, as far as capacity building goes, we're really looking forward to securing a vessel that could be utilized not only for oil spill response, but there's a large gap in and around the couch, let's just say the couch and bay area, for example. Um, many derelict vessels, many vessels that are borderline seaworthy. Uh, there have been a few vessel uh, fires uh, in the last couple of years in and around the Cowich and Bay, and there isn't um, a fire boat or a resource that's close by to kind of fill that void. Um, that was one thing that Tully and I discussed is having a landing craft that could be a multi-purpose transport um, forestry firefighters to the remote areas for us, uh, marine firefighting, and spill response type vessel uh, dedicated to those with the supplies on board. So we're looking for some direction from our chief and council and our partners like Finesse and CCG at DFO Transport Canada to maybe give us some guidance and some assistance to have the right kind of boat to fill that void in our area. Um, that's pretty much where we are with it. Tully, I don't know if you have anything you wanted to really add um, as far as uh, a new vessel coming online, that sort of thing. Oh, here, I'll get it to work. Uh, th thanks, Brigham. No, um, nothing to add um, so far. We're just working working through that process where, where we can and talking to our partners as some of them are online today, certainly know that we've talked about this thing. So um, thank you. Any questions or how we started to build our spill response from anybody? Brigham, in the chat, uh, James indicated 
Diddy Dot purchased a funded landing craft in coordination with WCMRC was coordinated through Fisheries and Natural Resources Department. Yeah, excellent. We have uh, had some collaboration with WCMRC. I was up in their Nanaimo base last week, and we had uh, some discussion with them regarding their Vessel of Opportunity program and uh, joint training. And I know, uh, thanks CCG, uh, your uh, training schedule for 24-25 was just released, and uh, there's a few courses we're hoping to sign some of our Marine staff up for. That's great. Are there any um, questions people would like to ask of the presentation? Are they raising hands or um, if you're on the phone, just jump in. Monica Short, I see your hand. <clears throat> Hi, yeah, I was just curious. Um, you mentioned that you had the, the two different equipment storage areas and I was wondering what uh, funding you used to purchase those or if they were in partnership with the Coast Guard or what, yeah. What that was. Yeah, so they uh, they were in partnership with the Coast Guard through the CDCR grants. Um, the C cans, the two C cans with the containment boom, the contractor containment boom, were purchased uh, the previous year before I started with Couch and Tribes. And since I've been here, we've uh, purchased the mobile trailer and the uh, supplies that are in that mobile trailer. So in the mobile trailers, uh, the bulk of the items are for marine response salt water there are a few things we could utilize for fresh water be it the couch and lake couch and river and then a couple little items for you know drain coverage that sort of thing but all the funding came through uh, coast guard and the cdcr grant great thanks are there any additional questions on the presentation maybe i'll just ask a really quick one um from from the beginning, uh, how long has it taken to build your program to where where it's at now? Well, Casey, it, it kind of stalled out a little bit. Um, prior to my arrival, there was a spill response coordinator and a, uh, a marine supervisor. The marine supervisor is off on maternity leave. I believe she's due to come back in the next few months. And the spill response coordinator departed the position prior to my arrival. So there was a gap of probably about two and a half months. Uh, the sea cans were purchased under their watch, and since uh, Tully and I have been under the emergency service umbrella, we've brought on that trailer and all the supplies within it, and a vehicle to tow it. We did buy a truck also uh, through Couch and Tribes, not through any type of grant funding, uh, so we can make that trailer mobile and place it uh, wherever we need to for ease of deployment. Good stuff. You're looking. Yeah, I don't know yeah. if I answered your question, but probably four months. <laughs> Sounds like a good program that's emerging and it can only get better. Um, are there any uh, any other questions of the presentation? Uh, Terry, I see your hand raised. I was wondering if you could put in the chat your funding, who I'm sorry, I missed the first part of it. For sure your can. spill response sea cans, that would be amazing. Hala. Sure can. I can. I probably Coast Guard could speak to more on this uh, when they get to their turn. But uh, it was through Canadian Coast Guard and the CDCR grant funding, and that was available for 23-24. I believe there is another round of that funding for 24-25, and then that would be coming to an end. Uh, but I could put all that in the chat for you. I appreciate it. Thank you much for all the good information. Uh, one last call for questions. Otherwise, we will proceed with our next presentation. So seeing no hands, um, I'd like to introduce uh, agenda topic number three, uh, DFO and CGC roles in marine emergency management, marine spill response um, with uh, Sarah. Sarah, do you want to take it away and screen share? Hi, um, and I'm going to ask a really stupid question now. How do I screen share in Zoom? <laughs> On the bottom of your screen, um, about midway, there's a share screen. Oh, share screen. The big and then if you screen. have it, if you have your presentation open, then it'll it'll show and then you click on it and I'll let you know when it's on screen. Okay. There it is. Perfect. Sure. Is it up? You are on screen. 
I got it. Awesome. Okay, thank you. I uh, just wanted to say thank you to everybody for welcoming me here. Um, I am speaking from the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people in Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh out of North Vancouver. Uh, but I also have a tendency to recognize that uh, we're all coming from so many different places with the same goal of protection of the marine environment, uh, which was what is 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 fills me with happiness. Uh, I've got to say, I don't mean to say that lately because I just got back from Ottawa last night and it's as important as it is, as it is to talk to our headquarters folks, there's always a sigh of relief when we come back to the region and can talk to the people who really actually do the work and are, are at the front line of everything. So I'm seeing some chats here. So I, just so you know, I can't see that, but Wayne or James or Rita, if there's anything there that you think I should stop talking and address, please speak up. Um, so what I'm gonna do is, uh, <clears throat> sorry, Given that there's a lot of people here who don't know Coast Guard, there's some here who do, and you're more than aware of what we do. You can probably deliver this presentation. Um, just bear with me for a little bit here, and I'll, I'll run you through some basics. Um, and then what we can do is either address questions here or make arrangements for myself or one of the members of my team to come and talk to you one-on-one -on -one or by Zoom or however you prefer. We're going to try and get out in person. Um, that's not always possible given the current fiscal climate, but we certainly want to. Um, so Yannick, to answer your questions about what changed with environmental response, well, we're now marine environmental and hazard response. Um, what that means, I'm going to talk to you really briefly and then I'll get to my presentation. Um, what that means is we also, we have powers under the Canada Shipping Act um, for pollution response, but we also now have uh, some authorities under the Wrecked and Abandoned Hazardous Vessels Act, or WAVA. So that's to do with derelict vessels and what have you. Um, I'm not going to speak knowledgeably about that because I'm actually taking training in a couple of weeks. So I know enough to be dangerous and that I don't know everything. Um, but that means that there are some different authorities um, for our response officers. Coast Guard's had them for a while. Um, but now we also have a compliance and enforcement branch who focus strictly on enforcement of certain powers. So there's, there's, we're still working on where our cutoff is and where we stop and they, they pick up and things like that. But what that means is that you probably wanna to talk to us about anything pollution or derelict vessel wise in your waters, we can at least point you in the right direction. So uh, I'm gonna to talk to you first about response planning, um, just because I, I come from, um, a world where the saying is, do what you document, document what you do. Now, some of you likely, I think Couch and Tribes does, right? Have a, a response plan. You have your own response plan, don't you? Um, and uh, I know others here do as well. There's someone, uh, Santana from Kitasu Hey Hey and others as well, I'm forgetting names, I apologize, from the Northern Shelf Fire region where there has been some work already well underway there. Um, in some areas, there's a response plan already de developed that's being uh, finalized. There's a framework um, in the Northern Shelf Fire Region for how we work together and how we respond, what goes into a response plan, how we would respond together. Um, so that's that's key. That's not led by Coast Guard. That's a tripartite agreement between the province, the nations, uh, and the uh, federal partners under the Oceans Reconciliation Framework Agreement. In this, and I have mentioned that um, not only because it's important, but also because Brigham brought up the co-developing community response planning, which of course is what drives a lot of the work and funds a lot of the work, probably more importantly than drives in the Southern area. So those nations, there are 33 nations along the tanker route into Vancouver who under uh, Trans Mountain accommodations have received funding as Brigham mentioned, and I'm probably oversimplifying that. Um, please feel free to correct me. But, and that funding, of course, ends in 2025, right as it stands right now. Um, so uh, I know Coast Guard's watching that space right now, or at least my team are, because uh, we've come to really quite, uh, I wanna say rely on the capacity that's been developed under that initiative. Um, but that's my own personal opinion there. So I'm going to stop. So our response plans uh, in the North, like I, I mentioned before, is the tripartite, tri trilateral agreement. Um, in the South, we've worked with a number of parties. 
Um, so I'm going to give you Vancouver as an example because that's the one I've worked on the longest um, and can talk to the, the most about, but we can talk about others as well. Uh, and in all of our four southern planning areas, we have federal departments such as Coast Guard, DFO, Transport Canada, Environment and Climate Change Canada, certainly not last but not least, um, Canada Energy Regulator, mostly in the Vancouver area, but they are interested in our other conversations, Parks Canada, um, and I'm probably missing two or three in there as well. Health Canada just got into the conversation. So we're, we're getting um, the right jurisdictions from the federal side in there. On the province side, we've certainly had uh, an amazing um, reaction, a response and involvement over the years. Ian himself has been involved in response planning over the years. Jamie, others from the province, uh, from both environment and uh, Sorry, Jane, uh, Ian, you're now called Emergency Management and Climate Resilient, EMCR. Did I get that right? Um, I apologize, what used to be EMBC before that was Provincial Emergency Program. They have been uh, strong partners of ours along the way. Uh, municipal government, uh, that should include regional government as well, local government basically, um, and most definitely last but not least, indigenous and coastal communities. We definitely lean very heavily uh, where we can, where there's a capacity to do so, we are leaning more and more heavily in those uh, on your communities. Um, because honestly, nobody knows the local area like you do. And on our whole point of doing response planning is to inform responders. It's not just Coast Guard responders, that's anyone who is out responding. Um, and we will also support, uh, I know there's a uh, gentleman here from Musqueam Indian Band. We've, were, I've personally worked with Musqueam over the years, uh, developing their own uh, plan. I've worked with other nations, so if others on the call, um, if you need us to come in and explain how we're doing it in other areas so that we can learn from each other, we wanna know how you're doing it, that kind of thing. The more we can share, the better, uh, and anything we can do to further that. I'm gonna move on to the next slide. Um, so as you can see, there's the, the eight areas there. I, I forgot to mention that we have eight areas, four in the North, the four Northern Shelf Bioregion region, sub regions, and then the four uh, regions in the South. So we also, uh, I'm gonna gloss past this, but um, you'll recognize, I'm sure that incident, that was the Zim Kingston, which of course was for us a turning point. It was a, <sighs> hard lesson for everybody to learn um but it also highlighted for us and and raised some lessons noted what we call lessons noted for us on how we work with our u.s coast guard colleagues this was not an activation of the joint marine pollution contingency plan because the incident was very clearly in canadian waters but we did then and in other subsequent incidents uh, work very closely with our U.S. Coast Guard partners. So regardless of whether or not we've actually quote unquote activated a plan, we still use our contacts, we still use our capacity that is part of the plan, which in this case, in that case in particular, involved working with Canada Border Services to get salvage operators across the, the border, for example. Um, so it's a, it's a good example of how we all work as much as we can with as many people as we can. Um, so get down to the crux of things. I'm trying to keep this brief. I'm sorry, a bit of a talker. Um, so for those, this is the basic part of the presentation. Um, so there's the initial alert of the system. Um, so we've got our pollution reporting line, which is right there. There, of course, is also the line at EMCR. Please tell me if I got that acronym wrong. Uh, what I should have fixed this, so apologies. Um, both end up at that desk that's pictured here uh, in the photograph. And the information then goes out to our duty officers as well right now. Um, and bring in my note uh, for sure, we need to talk about notifications um, because they're not necessarily happening the way we would like them to happen, but we're open to suggestions there, but we do notify uh, nations and others of an incident. Um, when it occurs, hopefully quickly after it occurs. And yeah, definitely have noted the fact that what we consider a, a uh, recoverable spill is not by any means the same benchmark that others uh, such as yourselves would, would take into consideration. So we're, we're listening, might need a little bit of an explanation for us. We're happy to listen to the explanation. 
Um, so then what happens uh, after the duty officer has been notified, I don't, we don't wanna read the slide here, but it's kind of tempting to. So the duty officer will then conduct a full assessment of the situation. This is where the relationships we're building with nations uh, in particular are so critical because it could be that a duty officer and yourself are talking after the report has come in and collectively assessing it will be a discussion with the provincial emergent environmental folks as well. There are a number of conversations that will take place. It could be a duty officer and a marina operator because they're the ones that are on scene and our guys can't get our and girls can't get out necessarily right away, but they're making phone calls, talking to people, getting as much information as they can about what's going on. It gets validated. Um, so again, they would count on any eyes on the scene. Um, to be able to validate the information. So it doesn't, it's not just a crank caller or something that does happen. Um, and the pollutant themselves become identified. So we've got a whole other conversation and a presentation about the surveillance, uh, but the aircraft uh, identified here is a Transport Canada aircraft and they do the National Aerial Surveillance Program. And uh, they have, uh, they've actually just redone their, their way of, of assessing the amount of a spill, but they have equipment and sensors and all sorts of things to be able to give us as much information as possible. So we also have Coast Guard helicopters, there's people in boats, there's, there's everybody, the information gets collected. So then when a response is activated, we do identify an incident commander um, if this could be unified command, I'm sure there are those on the call who've been part of unified command or aware of that taking place, uh, because we will include a First Nations community, municipal government, provincial government, and when available, the polluter in that unified command. Um, any updates or information, this is one piece of information that, um, that doesn't necessarily come across clearly in the middle of an incident because of course people's emotions are very high but if if you receive a pollution report or we can send you out the or put it in the chat the information about where to send the information to we have a 24 7 regional operations center that rock there regional operations center if anybody has any information that can bear upon the response please contact the regional operations center by email by phone however you wish but to add to that um, a coordination call may be scheduled. This is part of our response plan. So that's why I started with the response plans discussion. So part of what we commit to do from the Canadian Coast Guard side of the house is to set up a coordination call. Now, it doesn't mean that we're the ones solely deciding to hold that coordination call. Um, chances are actually pretty high. It's probably one of my team that are saying, yeah, we should have a coordination call. There's more than one community affected, there's more than one um, partner in whatever regard affected. Um, it could also be a discussion between the BC Ministry of Environment um, uh, duty officer and ours, and also yourselves saying, we need to get more people on the call here. There's things going on in this area that, that people need to know more about. Um, this is a decision made. We have activation authority in the Canadian Coast Guard. There's only two or three of them. Um, but they will decide to activate it a quarter would activate a coordinated response, which means that it will be Coast Guard going out along with yourselves. It could mean that WCMRC WC has either been contracted by the polluter or by us to go out. It just means that anybody who's available and has resources to bring to the, the table is out or to the water is out on the water responding. So hearing about your landing craft is definitely very cool for us. I think that's cool for you guys too, but um, I think there's a, a good opportunity for our folks to work um, with yours and learn more about each other. Um, so the response itself is, uh, this is where it can get quite emotional because sometimes the polluter is on scene and has decided that they will take responsibility. Uh, which means that they're either taking measures themselves, they're directing measures themselves, they're paying for people to take measures themselves. It can mean any combination of things. We are still the lead agency. Uh, the role as the incident commander, um, the role used to be known as the federal monitoring officer. We are now an incident commander. Does it mean that we're not monitoring what's taking place? That, that's exactly what that means, but we're doing it alongside other expertise in the in the incident management team as well. 
Um, and I already mentioned to you about CSA, the Canada Shipping Act, and what is now Canada Shipping Act in WABA. Um, so if the owner is able to respond and is doing so, we will work alongside them and, and, and anybody else who is involved in the response. So the MV Europe, this is one, um, I personally, I worked on this one myself. I was the liaison officer. And so there was the report of, the, the, this is interesting uh, because a lot of the response planning that we do, not all of it, but some of the response planning that we do on the coast started with an incident called the Marathasa, which some of you may be familiar with, or what we call the English Bay oil spill because we name ours based on location, not name of vessel, um, but everybody knows it as the Marathasa. Now that was the first time we really properly used incident command system in a response, um, not entirely well. We had a lot to learn from that. We need some trust that we needed to build with other partners in the area, various things. And what the reason why I bring up MV Europe is because that was the so Samarathas was in 2015. By 2023, we'd been doing work together um, and we we did notification to response partners, partners, the area plan was activated. We had the owner, Coast Guard, um, three, I believe, nations, pr the province and the municipality in unified command. The owner took responsibility. It was one of those incidents that just seemed to be tailor-made for our response plans. Um, but from my perspective, what, what really struck home was the fact that we had the city of Vancouver, for example, just an example, there were many people um, in unified command with us. Um, whereas in Marathasa, the city of Vancouver may have been very negative and non and untrusting about working with the Coast Guard. Now it was the opposite. He was sitting next to us in the room. We were working together to common goals, common priorities, that kind of thing. So everything, all of the work that people have been putting into either response planning or capacity building went so far. Um, so we did provide leadership and direction there, but it really honestly wasn't needed as much as in some other cases. So that's kind of, it's not super quick, but that was what that was. This is a beautiful photograph taken by um, WCMRC responders of the MP Europe. Um, and uh, that was really a very generic presentation. And I see one hand up at least. I'm just gonna stop sharing, I think. I'm going to try to. And I'd like to ask if um, if people would mind if we did the questions combined after the um, DFO presentation by Cynthia. Would that be OK, Monica? Stop. Sure. sure. I, I mainly just had a bit of additional information that I was hoping to add, if that's OK. Uh, sure. If you could briefly add it, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah. I'm just I'm uh, work for the the Kinsuhehe's Nation, so we've been participating in the uh, joint response planning in the NSB um, under the NSB framework. And I would just like to add that I guess in this presentation it, it says that that Coast Guard is the incident commander and has the activation authority, but in the framework that we have outlined and the uh, response plans that we've been working on, any of the um, partnering organizations can be the incident commander um, and any of the partnering organizations do have the authority to activate a joint response. Um, so I just wanted to share that there's, you know, there's uh, fantastic work going on and that, you know, nations can also be the leaders in responses as well. Thank you for sharing that. Um, if we save questions, um... After the DFO one, we'll combine it. Uh, Cynthia, I'd like to invite you to do your presentation and I'll uh, I'll probably interject in about um, maybe at the 10, 12 minute mark. Yeah, no problem. And um, I've tried to keep mine very short as well and obviously opportunities to come back and um, do more detail. Let me just do the logistics here of sharing my screen. Um, and you can, let's do... One moment. All right, everybody see that front page? Yep, we can, thank you. Okay, perfect. 
So I'm going to try to pick up basically where Sarah left off. So um, although Coast Guard and DFO have the same minister, we do operate separately when it comes to spill response, have different roles and responsibilities. So I just want to kind of walk through there. In, in terms of the federal agencies, you know, Coast Guard, um, I think Sarah did a great job of describing sort of some of the capacities and capabilities there. Um, and Coast Guard is the lead operationally on the water. That's the way we would describe them very simply. Um, there's also Environment and Clim Climate Change Canada, who leads the coordination of scientific advice from other agencies and response partners, including Indigenous um, our Indigenous partners doing a response. And I'll touch on that quickly. And then you got DFO and um, Fisheries and Oceans Canada. So we are a support when it comes to scientific and technical advice. That's our role, as well as we do also lead on the marine mammal response for spills. So those are our two core roles. And of course, the province is a key partner, but I just I just put on the federal folks here for now. Um, so you've got that framework, you've got that, okay, where is DFO in the whole situation of, of uh, um, our roles and responsibilities? And then when you delve down a little bit more within DFO, we have our environment incident coordinators. And so those are the folks who I would describe are like the concierges of DFO. If you need uh, scientific technical advice related to aquatic species or habitat, the EICs are the ones that will gather that information from our subject matter experts internally, collate it, um, you know, make sure it's it's provided to uh, the response agencies and usually up through that environment and climate change Canada is how that information comes up. So we give information about um, vulnerable species and habitats, all of the data that you would assume that DFO would have handy. Um, and we do a lot of work to make sure that that's available in advance of a spill so that we have it at the ready quickly to pull it together and to bring forward during a response to inform what happens on the grounds. Um, we do have a generic email address there. I'll pop this in the chat later as well. Um, my email address is there for any follow-up questions, but also generically, like, or we have this generic email where any questions around spill response for DFO can go to and somebody is gonna uh, respond and answer that. Um, and then when we're talking about the other part of what DFO does, so we do that scientific and technical advice piece, we also are the lead for the marine mammal um, response, and that includes deterrence, recovery, uh, monitoring of marine mammals. And that's done through our marine mammal unit within DFO with support from our conservation and protection folks. So the enforcement arm of DFO also has a, a, a big role to play on the water when it comes to marine mammals. And I think this might touch on a little bit of, of sort of the discussions there. So, you know, what I wanted to do is say, to just, you know, give you the sense that this is how the framework works in the Pacific region, you know, Coast Guard Lead Environment Canada Lead Scientific Agency within DFO where they're supporting. And then when you're actually doing a response, this is the ICS structure. And you can see, you know, environment incident coordinators, this is where we sit. We sit within the environmental unit. And that's where our core role is. There's also the role of the marine mammals through operations, but really when it comes to a spill, DFO is gonna be located within that environmental unit. And these are our partners that are with us um, within that um, environmental unit. So uh, for folks that maybe haven't gone through an exercise or a response, um, basically we sit around virtually or at a table, all these folks and additional additional folks as well as needed. Um, but this would be, I would say, the, the core group and would develop what we would call um, a resource at risk. And so that's really a sensitivity map that highlights what are the what are the lo what are the sensitive species and habitat in the area of the spill. And so this is what each of those partners brings to the table. And I think for folks again that maybe haven't had uh, an experience in a spill, um, previously, this is something where um, the information coming from the communities is crucial um, because, you know, we have our data layers from surveys, um, but we don't have somebody that's on the ground that's lived there that says, no, actually, the water flows a little bit funny at this time of year because of the freshwater interaction. So the, you're saying the oil is going to go this way, but actually it doesn't really. It, it'll go this way. So it's really important to make sure that we have all those partners um, at the table to be able to provide that, that information to inform the response. 
And I know folks were looking um, and wanting to get some information in terms of opportunities for collaboration, um, resources. And so um, within DFO, we do have a small grants and co um, contribution agreement program. And I'd, I'd like to highlight it. Unfortunately, it is small. Um, we're not the only agency with funding, but uh, we do have a, a small uh, GNC program. And it's intended to increase Indigenous participation in oil spill, planning, training, other activities. Um, however, other partner agencies also have that type of funding. Um, what DFO can do that some of the other partners aren't able to, though, is we're able to fund um, the gathering and documenting and recording of uh, traditional ecological knowledge. And so, you know, it, that's... It, Within the environmental unit, that is crucial. So having that information available, um, and there's different ways of going about this. Um, but you know, just just as a uh, you know, make sure it's very clear. It's not information that has to be provided to any agency. It's for the use and um, to be kept by the indigenous community. So not asking for any information to be provided in advance, but it's so that. Uh, communities can prepare and have that that indig indigenous knowledge available to them. So I always I always kind of flag that because that's sort of something that we can do that a lot of other agencies aren't able to. Um, we also collaborate on the marine mammal training component. Folks may know Paul Cottrell if he's done training, I think, with a bunch of the different nations that are participating today. So you may have heard his name, but there's opportunities to also do uh, training uh, around marine mammal deterrence. Um, and if there's interest there, I can link folks up. And then there's also our science folks within DFO uh, have a myriad of different collaborations with different nations on specific projects, whether it's remote camera work, whether it's shoreline imagery. Um, so there's we're, we're always looking for opportunities. So here's, here's a, a chance if there are projects that you think might be of interest that are related to spills, let me know. I can link you up with the appropriate folks to explore those opportunities. Um, and that's really just it very in a nutshell. But there is opportunity to come back at any point and talk a little bit more about the information that we do have available um, when we go to a response, because I think folks might be interested in some of our science um, that we use as, as sort of our core information and forming our response vulnerabilities to oil species fact sheets and other things that are available. Okay, I talked really quick. That's awesome, Cynthia. I see in the chat, Sarah's put in um, that she could be a contact for sources of information on Canada Coast Guard grants and contribution funding. Sarah, I'll definitely reach out to you because I'll be updating the uh, finesse emergency management funding list and uh, see if there's any gaps in the information I have. Are there any questions on either of these two presentations? Um, maybe uh, if you could stop sharing screen. Um, people raise hands. I, I, I'm scrolling through. And it's okay if there's not, there's a lot of um, good information in there. And contact information is in all the chats. Um, barring any questions, I'd like to move on to uh, number four, BC Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategy. Uh, Jamie Galt, if you're ready to start your presentation. Hey, Katie, I am. Can you hear me now? I switched over my microphone. Is that a little bit better? It's a little bit better. You're a little thin, but it's, it's good. Okay, I don't know what's happening. The Zoom is uh, challenging sometimes. Uh, we can get to your screen. Okay, you can see my screen now too? Perfect. Okay, uh, I'm gonna just get folks sorted out here. And I'll uh, I'll chime in at around the 10, 12 minute mark, just as a, a heads up. Perfect. Thank you very much, folks. Okay. Um, yeah, good afternoon. My name is Jamie Galt. I'm the manager of response for the Environmental Emergency Program. Um, I'll quickly just talk about the provincial role and specifically our role as the, uh, as the provincial lead for spill response. Uh, I thought it was sort of uh, useful to, to add this picture on the screen just at the uh, MV, uh, or MV Maple River, um, which was a spill incident in Nanaimo this past summer, um, sort of 
uh, right in Nanaimo Harbor uh, and made response a little bit easier as uh, it's right outside of the St. Marcy's offices there. But I think it was an example of good coordination between uh, the Coast Guard, uh, our program, um, and then certainly all the First Nation partners that were there and participated in her hearing voices. So um, I think uh, it is an example of us working together uh, towards bill response, um, though it was fairly easy response and that we had all the resources right there. Um, um, our program is pretty small. We have about just under 40 people to be responsible for this uh, provincial spill program across the province, uh, mainly dealing with uh, spills to provincial territory or inland spills. Um, but we're the lead provincial regulator uh, for hazardous materials and uh, those types of spills. Um, we do plan and have provincial level plans. Um, and then we basically manage those with all of our provincial level or provincial uh, partners uh, in, in the marine context, um, with specifically with our federal partners, certainly our First Nation partners are critical to that. Um, like our federal partners, we hold the responsible party accountable for spills within the province of BC. Um, and we hold them accountable uh, in the pull your pay principle, which I think came through in Sarah's presentation. Um, and they will try to put the onus or put the onus on the responsible party first and see if they're capable to respond. And we also uh, carry that forward um, through provincial uh, response. For my rest of my presentation, I'll do like Sarah did a bit of a quick overview of just our program and uh, and then we'll jump into the specific marine environment and how we support. But I think uh, you probably have got the thread that we are at the table with our federal partners um, supporting a provincial perspective and, and making sure that First Nation voices are being heard uh, appropriately. Um, I will jump into a little bit of a legislative uh, overview because I think it is sort of uh, just good to, good to ground ourselves into legislation. Um, I will say that our authority as the Minister of Environment, Climate Change Strategy, uh, is sort of to respond to spill events of hazardous materials as generated from the Emergency Program Act, now called the Emergency and Disaster Management Act. I'm sure the folks are, uh, some of the folks are well versed in that legislation. And emergency management, climate readiness, uh, you know, is responsible for that. But underneath that, uh, they delegate hazards to different ministries, and they've delegated essentially the, the hazardous materials to the Ministry of Environment. That's how we become responsible for coordinating that. So we really are um, the lead provincial agency on hazardous materials, and we are the ones that will be coming to the table and talking with their federal partners, specifically um, when spill events occur as a response, but also as a planning initiative. Um, but in further detail, how we actually manage that is through the Environmental Management Act in the province. And that piece of legislation has lots of uh, details on how we hold uh, spillers responsible and how we undertake actions. So I won't get into the nitty gritty of that, but that's essentially uh, the regulations that we use to make sure that folks are doing um, what they should when they spill materials in the province. It also has uh, details on what needs to be recorded, uh, correction reported uh, to the province, what has to be planned for, who falls into uh, certain elements of a regulated party. Um, and it has details of just exactly how we would respond, um, correction, prepare, respond, and then also has recovery elements within that legislation. Now, not within legislation, but certainly principles that we adhere to. I've listed them on the right hand side. Um, I just mentioned the polluter pay principle as sort of the, one of the paramount ones. But you also see the other list, and I think you've probably also heard threads of this throughout uh, the presentations um, from my federal sort of colleagues. But emergency management is a shared responsibility. Uh, we find in the spill environment that jurisdiction complexity um, is almost present in every single uh, one of our spill events. Um, and so we really do have to come to the table with uh, a multitude of different agencies from federal partners to local authorities, First Nation. And then a key component is that responsible person, the person who actually did that, uh, that had this bill. And we really want to hold them accountable for making sure that they do the right thing to, to, uh, to A, respond and make things up appropriately. Um, certainly, we do want to do take a risk approach to this. And I think this is an important discussion right now as we are uh, implementing elements of the Declaration Act and moving towards making sure that First Nations are equal partners. Um, I think this is challenging our perspective on, on how we do business and more specifically, how we are weighing traditional knowledge into our risk assessment. So I think that's pretty nascent work, but I think we're seeing that in our inland spill response that we need to do a better job of hearing First Nation voices and, and um and traditional perspectives. And I think we are getting there, but um, 
you know, I think there's still more work to do. Um, so I think we're looking for opportunities to keep learning and, and including those, uh, those voices. Um, we do follow uh, the provincial emergency management structure. So the ICS terms and the, the BC emergency management uh, structure that I'm sure uh, Ian will detail a lot after me, uh, but, but we certainly follow that process and we integrate into the scalability of the incident command system. And then lastly, I think it is important that we do undertake a net environmental benefit analysis for, for response. So that becomes a consideration when we undertake works to making sure that our, what we are doing is in the best interest of the environment. So um, that is an analysis that does need to happen at the, at the scientific end of the table to support our response initiatives. So yeah, apologies for the bit of an overview of, of that, but I thought it was good to ground us into, um, into how the province sort of supports uh, our federal partners in the marine environment. My thought, this is an important map um, as it sort of shows our response time for our officers and where we are able to get to within five hours. Um, you'll note for marine environment, it is it is not our primary jurisdiction. So we don't have the capability to be able to get to most marine locations in a timely manner. We rely on our federal partners to be able to do that. Um, however, our broader team is broken down into preparedness, a team that does a lot of our planning initiatives, uh, and legislative initiatives, um, small but mighty little team. Um, most of our staff do uh, sit in the response section and are originally based in four different regions. Um, and then we do have a small but growing recovery team, which is really our uh, scientific end that does our liaison with the, our DFO counterparts, uh, UCCC, um, and then other sort of scientific folks within the provincial level of government. Um, but yes, you will see that we are not well represented on the marine front, and uh, we uh, are looking for our federal colleagues to support, uh, or to support our federal colleagues in their uh, their jurisdiction. Our specific roles, though, I think uh, for marine response, um, I, I broke this into two different categories, what we do during planning and then what we do during response. Um, on the planning side of the house, we, we truly sit as the provincial representation for planning initiatives. So Sarah mentioned um, sort of right from the international agreements from CAN US DICs and PACs down to regional uh, planning is potentially even local plans, um, we would be involved at that full sort of spectrum. Um, and it really just comes down to an element of resourcing and how we can allocate our resources appropriately. Um, we also are there to foster relationships and maintenance building of those relationships is a key part of our work. Um, again, in the marine environment, we've already talked about some of those key folks at the federal table. Um, we also have international partners. We also have NGOs. We also have um, organizations like WCMRC that we also need to make sure that we are working with uh, across the province and, and uh, are there. So we work on those relationships as well. Uh, you will see us in um, at exercise and training events um, and usually as not as an organizer, but as a participant, um, but on some elements specifically as it relates to uh, any impacts to um, shoreline or online cleanup, we'll potentially be taking the lead or have taken some lead in the recent past on providing some supports to that type of training. One example, and um, it was just mentioned, but the shoreline cleanup and assessment training is one example of training packages that we've recently put a little bit of effort into supporting financially we've got access to some funds. And it looks like we'll be trying to do that into the future. And then lastly, on the planning perspective, we do, we are sort of the gateway into the rest of the provincial uh, provincial government with respect to coordination of activities. Um, certainly there is there is other connections within the Ministry of Environment or our different ministries such as forest or water, land, natural resources that we would be connecting in um, specifically related to the um, spills and maybe the overlap of other programs. Um, with respect to response or response to marine environments, again, generally for marine, um, the marine lead would be the marine lead is the federal uh, jurisdiction, but we take the provincial lead as the as soon as that uh, material touches the provincial lands, then we um, need to be part of that conversation. So, generally, we are right involved with uh, with response from the beginning, as there may always be an impact to provincial lands. Um, 
So before that, though, we were also involved in the notification process, and I'll talk a bit about that in, in a few minutes, but um, our notification process is in line with uh, the Coast Guard, but that follows a bit of a separate process. And you might actually receive two notifications for a marine event, one from the Canadian Coast Guard and then a follow-up from the province. And we're working on trying to streamline some of those um, notifications, but it's certainly an area that we know occurs. Um, we also would potentially coordinate provincial assets or resources um, dependent on the situation in that in in response. I mean, that generally that starts with our program and then it, that would expand from there depending on, on what is needed. Some of these resources may be specialists related to waste management and or authorizations for moving waste uh, during a response is a, is a common theme. Um, during the response, though, we certainly augment the augment a response in the form of you know, in the unified command, generally take the provincial command role. Um, and then we also have to support the environmental unit, which is which was previously previously discussed from that provincial perspective. Um, and then lastly, uh, yeah, sort of there's other details that may be included in, in regional plans or even even uh, international plans all the way down to local plans on, on certain aspects that we may take our roles in and not just a few of those are mentioned, conducting resources at risk assessment or the shoreline cleanup and, and uh, assessment training or the SCAT uh, or technique. Um, with respect to notification, um, I didn't, I didn't generate a slide that demonstrates the process, but to one of the elements of improvements that has been undertaken in the province um, is a First Nation spill notification project. This was born out of uh, work um, in the Northern Shelf bioregion um, in the North Coast and identified that um, essentially the provincial spill process was not uh, meeting the needs of First Nation partners it was not inclusive, it's not giving um, power to First Nations to decide what they were being notified about. And the aim was to rectify those sort of problems with a different approach to notifications. Essentially, in our current slash, uh, current slash um, normal way of notifying, a response officer will make an assessment on whether to notify rather than provide the power to select when not notifications would be given. Um, so essentially in our previous way, uh, uh, an era would undertake a, a risk assessment, determine which First Nations were impacted or other agencies, and then undertake a call out towards that. This was general labor intensive. We saw unreliability with our um, process uh, for our staff, and, and it was inconsistent with sort of UNDRIP and where the province is headed with, our with the Declaration Act and the commitment to First Nations. So as we assessed that, we landed on using uh, undertaking this project, which is the Alertable Project, which I know some First Nations online have experience with, um, where it essentially gives the power to First Nations to determine a area where they are notified. So they draw a um, polygon on the map, uh, determining which where an area that they would want to be notified for specific spills. And our when our officers take a notification undertaking notification process. Um, any spill that lands in that polygon will be a notification um, sent to that First Nation. And it is it can be elected on what type of notification from email to phone call to text message that they would receive. This is for initial notifications, um, but it basically creates a consistent approach to that. So we are really trying to provide more consistency and more uh, more autonomy and power to First Nations to decide what they should receive versus uh, an assessment by um, one of our response officers to deem if it was uh, needed or not. Um, so where we're currently at right now, we're, we're essentially in the pilot phase of this project with First Station or with funding from a specific program. Um, we've onboarded less than 20 First Nations across the province. So we're really in that learning phase and evaluating phase of this project. Um, we, the most of those First Nations are located in the North Coast, but there are some on the calls that have that have been onboarded in the situation or into the into the um, into the process. Uh, and we are currently taking undertaking enhancements based on some of that learning with our First Nation partners. We're also talking with our partners in Coast Guard and other uh, agencies like the BC Energy Regulator that also undertakes notifications for spills to try and harmonize. 
And we're also onboarding um, sort of on a one by one basis for stations that are interested in growing our um, our ability to one by one bring them on before we scale up to to a full provincial level program. And that really is the next strategic step for our programs to take this uh, province wide um, for all first stations uh, to be able to sign up to this um, to also harmonize our uh, alerts to um, um, to, to the with the BC Energy Regulator and the Canadian Coast Guard, and then to make sure it's integrated with uh, our provincial partners at EMCR for their other notification systems that are ongoing. And, and um, there's several different ways that uh, people and organizations can be notified in the province. So certainly working with EMCR on that front. Lastly, and this is, I think my last slide, and I'll move it sort of quickly through, sort of Casey. Um, last slide is just to go over some of the funding that we have and sort of just the small access to funding programs that we have. Um, we are in this fiscal year going to disperse just over, just about three hundred thirty thousand dollars to um, to indigenous funding program. Um, this is generally in a lot of SCAT courses, the shoreline cleanup and assessment training in three different First Nations. Um, also, some post spill analysis and enhancements to uh, some waste management capacity at Haida Nation. So, I think there's several First Nations on this call that are recipients of some of this funding. Um, and we've made similar requests for next fiscal year to support um, post spill monitoring um, in the marine environment, as well as what we're calling capacity building uh, for um, First Nations, which would include shoreline cleanup and assessment. So, Casey, that is it for me. That was rather quick, rattling above uh, what I do. Hopefully it wasn't too long, but I'm happy to take any questions or turn it over to Ian. Thank you very much. Uh, great information, um, concise. Uh, are there any questions of the two presentations, either by um, Jamie or Cynthia? Maybe rear hand, or if you're on the phone, type in. And it's okay if there's not. There's a lot of information presented and there's contact information. Casey, one now, what element I will say, if, um, we've, we're taking feedback from the First Nation partners uh, constantly on our alertable app. And I just saw Brigham in the um, uh, comment. And if there's First Nations, we're also looking for First Nations to partner with, with as we roll this out to other organizations to help us uh, provide. Um, a first nation perspectives to either communicate some of the challenges or the benefits of this approach. Um, so if folks are interested, I know you probably already, uh, those folks that are already on board feel alertable, um, know who our key contacts are, but certainly just want to uh, reinforce that while I have my time. Thank you, Jamie. I just put in the chat that um, I, I, I'm not that knowledgeable about marine emergency response. And I wonder if there exists um, uh, literature resources um, that are current and well organized. So um, once or twice a year, Finesse puts out wildfire resource list or flood. And I wonder if um, people on this call, especially First Nations, um, would be supportive and thinking that a resource list might be beneficial, including including training opportunities. Go ahead, Sarah. Hi, I'm happy to provide information. One of the challenges we have in the federal government is publishing things online. Um, we've had this challenge with our response plans. Um, there are Government of Canada requirements for publishing things on a website, so we don't have ours in one nice clean spot as much as we'd like to. But if somebody has somewhere where they can host us um, or there is a SharePoint site or something like that, whatever works for people, um, we are happy to put information up there. So I've seen a, a couple of people in the chat uh, think that's useful. Uh, maybe just a really quick show of hands on the screen if um, if people think that would be useful. And I'm I'm more than happy to uh, to try to assist and come up with a resource list. Seeing a couple more hands. Okay, great. Um, th thank you much to our federal cousins for that. Um, David, I see your hand raised. 
Oh, unless that, that was just supporting the, the list. That was it was in error. Instead of turning down my thumb, I turned on my hand. I I'll, I'll, I'll get it all together here. Okay. Um, <laughs> never mind. We have uh, 39 minutes left and we're down to two presentations. Um, my apologies, uh, Ish should have been on here. Uh, Yannick Lapierre is able to speak briefly on Ish's Ish, um, behalf. And uh, if you could keep your presentations brief, like uh, maybe the 10 minute mark, and then we'll take questions uh, at the end. Um, I'd like to start with Ian Cunnings, please. Ian, if you want to share your screen. Yep, I bet. Just uh, working on that right now there, Casey. Good to see you again, Ian. Yeah, thanks, my friend. Yep. Casey, I thought I had three hours. So we see the screen. Good. Good, good, good. Now, if I can just get it to uh, move. There we go. So, uh, I get. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Again, my name is uh, Ian, Senior Director for Regional Operations uh, at EMCR, and going to uh, provide what I hope uh, is just a bit of a refresher uh, on uh, EMCR uh, operations and what we might bring to the table. Uh, on the uh, funding side, I'm going to touch a little bit uh, more on response claims, but I did put a link uh, in the chat to uh, the Community Emergency Prepared Preparedness Fund. Uh, and if you aren't uh, already aware of that, I uh, encourage you to uh, go to that link and see uh, the various funding uh, opportunities that are there. Uh, and if you have any questions around those specifically, uh, my email is also in the chat. So uh, I always like to start with this first slide uh, in that uh, emergency management uh, is absolutely a shared responsibility uh, and certainly spills are no, no exception where really no one agency or community uh, can go about this alone. Uh, and that if you've already heard from our uh, federal partners in Ministry of Environment, uh, there certainly is a layered approach uh, to spill response, uh, not just in BC, but in Canada. So uh, the various emergency management cycles that are now also uh, clearly identified within the uh, newly minted uh, Emergency Program Act that uh, came into uh, effect uh, last fall, uh, I spend uh, a great deal of my time uh, in response, which is uh, what we're talking on uh, talking about today. Uh, but that doesn't diminish uh, the preparedness mitigation uh, and recovery aspects uh, of emergency management and emergency response. So some of the things that uh, we bring to the table for both uh, Indigenous and local government. Uh, one, and uh, you heard Sarah reference, uh, you know, part of uh, the spill response plan uh, is a coordination call. Uh, and often uh, EMCR will get asked to assist either uh, our federal partners or Ministry of Environment uh, in engaging communities uh, into a uh, coordination call uh, where we would hope the appropriate subject matter experts are there uh, to provide you with an update uh, and situational awareness uh, and more importantly uh, an update from impacted community uh, and what the various needs may be. Sometimes it takes a while to gather uh, all the folks uh, required onto a coordination call, because you can appreciate if it happens at four o'clock in the morning, uh, tracking down the appropriate people uh, or over a long weekend uh, can be challenging. So sometimes uh, it takes a little while to get things going. And then one of the other major roles 
uh, that we play is disseminating information. So I'm hoping that uh, the majority on the call, uh, when we have things coming out like uh, weather warning, uh, or it could be uh, a high stream flow advisory, uh, or more important with this call, uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada uh, may be issuing uh, a flood advisory as a result uh, of a king tide uh, that we would disseminate, disseminate that information out to uh, our emergency management partners. Some of the other uh, event specific things that we provide uh, is that you would be able to contact uh, the Emergency Coordination Center, uh, which is our basically your 24-7 contact uh, into uh, EMCR. Uh, and if you are uh, having uh, to respond to an event uh, and it is something that fits with uh, in our legislation, uh, then you would be issued a task number, uh, which then provides uh, you with uh, being able to incur or, or be eligible to incur costs uh, that uh, we would then reimburse you for uh, as uh, outlined in our fin financial guidelines. But our 1-800 number can also be used for uh, an information source. So as an example, uh, if you weren't sure uh, about uh, responding to something uh, and you just had a query, uh, and even if that was for uh, one of our federal partners or another ministry, uh, the uh, staff at the Emergency Coordination Center have a very robust Rolodex and would be happy to connect you with uh, the right agency or ministry. One of the things that I always encourage uh, our partners to do uh, is uh, if in doubt uh, in terms of is an expense eligible or not, uh, is to, through your emergency operations center, send in what we call an expense authorization form or an EAF or simply give us a call or send us an email uh, with the inquiry and we'll get back to you. Uh, even if uh, it is something outside of the EMCR legislation, we work quite closely with our other partners, uh, such as ISC, to try to wrestle down on your behalf who might be best to help you uh, with the cost that you're incurring. Uh, and one of the things particularly, well, really with any response, but very important in a spill response is for you to track all of the costs that you have uh, associated with the event. Uh, we won't get into uh, some of the legislation, uh, both federally and provincially, uh, around the spiller's responsibility, uh, that that would be a great topic for another day. But it's important to track those costs. So uh, if uh, we can, then provincially or federally go after the party who is uh, responsible for the spill in the first place. We also uh, are happy to assist uh, Indigenous and local government uh, with accessing resources that you may not have uh, within your community. Uh, and we also partner up uh, with Finesse uh, and ISC uh, in looking at what resources may be available to you there. Then when it comes time for uh, getting some funding back uh, from EMCR, uh, we have uh, a response claim process uh, and uh, our regional staff are more than happy uh, to either virtually or whenever we can uh, get out to uh, community uh, and provide you with uh, what I like to call Finance 101 uh, to walk you through 
uh, the reimbursement claim process uh, so that you're not alone uh, and left figuring out uh, how to get some money back from EMCR. And uh, some of the other uh, alert mechanisms that uh, we can bring to the table. And uh, again, uh, within a spill response, uh, while it's out uh, on the in the salt water environment, uh, as you've heard from our federal federal partners, that falls in their wheelhouse uh, in both uh, Coast Guard and Environment and Climate Change Canada do have the ability, uh, if uh, it meets the requirements, to initiate a broadcast intrusive uh, alert, meaning being able to interrupt television uh, and radio, as well as going to uh, an over an LTE network, so to a wireless device to alert people uh, about a public safety risk uh, and then uh, on the land side of things, uh, the province of BC uh, also has that same ability. Uh, and I'm hoping many of you uh, have uh, received, we probably, I think, had two or three since uh, the province has uh, adopted uh, the Alert Ready program, uh, a broadcast intrusive alert test. Another uh, key thing uh, that we uh, bring in, particularly for our First Nation partners, uh, is the uh, Nation's Community Navigator, uh, largely uh, to help communities uh, assist with evacuation uh, and evacuation preparations. Uh, and uh, all that is eligible. Uh, under an EMCR task number. And then uh, within large scale evacuations, that community navigator can also uh, assist with culturally appropriate uh, spaces uh, and activities and support during an evacuation. When it comes into uh, some of the uh, the broader supports that uh, we can collectively bring to the table under the MASS program or the multi-agency support team is really uh, a team of agencies that would come into communities uh, and conduct a uh, in-person visit uh, while uh, an emergency event has happened to look at further supports that may be required. Uh, I've seen this done uh, on a smaller scale uh, within a spill response, but uh, more commonly used uh, within a wildfire and a flooding scenario, because uh, unfortunately we see those more often, uh, but know that that is available uh, to community uh, in something that uh, our federal partners have also participated uh, in with other provincial agencies uh, and ministries. Thank you, Ian. Just to flag, you're at the 13-minute mark. And perfect timing, Casey, as always. Uh, that's what I uh, have uh, for the group today uh, and happy to uh, uh, answer any questions that folks may have today. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, if you could stop share screening, um, I can see the hands a bit easier on my screen. Perfect. Yeah, I'm just doing that now, Casey. There you go. Are there any questions of the EMCR presentation uh, by a show of hands? There's some good information there. And for those who work in emergency management, I'm sure you've, you've seen some of that before. It's always a good refresher. And it's okay if there's not. Um, I have that I'm just putting in the chat. Um, and it's for our EMCR and our um, federal colleagues is on the common operating pictures. So um, in a previous job during the Zim Kingston, um, you know, we saw information on coordination calls, Zoom meetings 
with different federal common operating pictures. And um, when I would go check the common operating picture by EMCR and GOBC, I found that there wasn't any information. So my question to the two governments, if there's any thoughts or discussion on coordinating. So in the future, if there's an event that there'll be information put on the public facing provincial common operating picture. Um, if if either government can just super briefly respond to that, that'd be great. Yeah, Casey, I can um, start with that one. Uh, and uh, I know there have been uh, conversations around uh, how to link up uh, the uh, EMCR COP uh, with our fifth federal partners. Uh, I'm just not sure where those conversations are, uh, but I will add it to my list to talk with GOBC about that, Casey, and get back to you on that one. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Uh, any of the federal cousins like to just briefly comment? Sarah? I, I will because uh, you're absolutely right. Um, federal departments have their own COPs. You're absolutely right. It's not consistent yet. I know there are projects in the works to look at this. Um, and I think, again, any suggestion that comes from this table or anyone who knows more about this than I do, quite frankly, um, I think this would be a great place to start. Your example about Zim Kingston is a great one. We use the Trello board for sharing information, but that's not the same thing as a COP. Um, and I know, I think Ian, you and I have talked in the past a long time ago about the fact that there was one done for uh, the Olympics or something, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, so we know it, it kind of can be done, but I don't know with today's technology, if we've gotten too far or not far enough or, yeah, 100% behind this, though. I think it'd be great because uh, the uh, provincial COP is public facing and it's a uh... It's a great way to access what the common operating picture actually is. So it's a bit more common. What what it's supposed to be? Yeah, it'd be nice if we could work on that. So, but that's that's above my my skill set, I must admit. But that doesn't mean we can't get the right people in the conversation. Thank you. Um, last call for any questions of um, of Ian before I move on to Indigenous Services Canada. We have another um, 21 minutes left. Um, I'd like to introduce Yannick Lapierre, and my apologies, Yannick, I should have had ISK on this agenda. Um, you can take it away, and I'll give you a polite reminder at the 10 or 12 minute mark. Um, yeah, I, 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 I don't have a lot of presentation uh, or a presentation specific to this. I, I could use a presentation from the past in terms of like what is EMAP and all that kind of stuff. Not very help, uh, useful for, for this kind of conversation, uh, in my opinion, but um, I, I can kind of talk about how what the ISC's uh, mandate is around this, which, uh, which is very limited. Um, so usually we kind of, we would play a uh, and a liaison partner with with the other federal agencies uh, during spills uh, or emer emergency response. So we, we would turn to Coast Guard, Transport, DFO, um, and Environment Canada to um, to to coordinate that the the response activities. Uh, we could provide some uh, additional support to First Nations in terms of liaising the nations to the the proper uh, agency if that's not already been done but i know that um my 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 colleagues at, at the other departments uh do that on a regular basis so not uh sorry my my daughter's here um so uh okay 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 it's not not that kind of thing right now um so yeah so yeah so in terms of emap really the, the the program the these kinds of of things are outside of the of the program because uh, most of what emap does uh are related to natural hazards so not uh man-made hazards or uh hazard uh released from from chemicals or uh or, or boats so those those mandates are clearly in in a in uh you know coast guard transport canada uh, and Department of Fishery and Oceans and Environment Canada. So, 
if there's any questions, like I said, I, I know a lot of these folks um, and I can easily connect people if that needs, if the person doesn't know, if the community doesn't know who, who to contact for, um, for a spill and that kind of stuff. And again, AMCR is always a great resource for, for coordinating that, that kind of um, activities. If the nation doesn't know who would be a good contact for that. So, um, but if there's any questions related to that or any, anything, do let me know and I, I'll try to answer as best as I can. Thank you, Yannick. And um, Ian's presentation talked about the multi-agency support team meetings or perhaps even calls. And I'm assuming ISK, as usual, can play a pretty valuable role in those calls. Yeah, it's, you know, we're we're willing to help other de departments and, and First Nation communities to, to try to connect with a proper person, the proper uh, agent or the proper department if need be. But um, yeah, and, and if there's any concerns, anything that are beyond uh, marine spills, uh, that kind of stuff, EOC activation, you know, we, we can discuss it with uh, with the nation and or with the MCR, depending on, you know, what the request is. So the, these kinds of things, again, as I said, they're a bit outside. So we would have to find the justification um, to, to kind of get roped in. But um, again, happy to to be that oil kind of um, try to try to connect people if need be. Thank you very much, Yannick, as always. Are there any questions on the presentation by Indigenous Services Canada? And it's okay if uh, if everyone's heard a lot today. Uh, show of hands. And I think we can reclaim part of our day. Um, my thanks to uh, all the presenters, especially Couch and Tribes. I, uh, I bow my head in respect for the work that you've done and the work that uh, our provincial and federal departments are doing in this area and the time that people have taken. Um, I just want to flag a few dates with people. On March 21st, and this will be sent out to the First Nations Circle of uh, Practice emails, and people can email me as well. On March 21st, uh, from 10 till noon, there's a First Nations information session on the BC Emergency Preparedness Strategy um, for Food Security Engagement. That's a provincial launch. And on April 4th, 9 till noon, we're doing a First Nations information session on railway incidents in coordination with uh, CN and CP and some others. And then as usual, we have our monthly First Nations Circle of Practice. Uh, usually the first Tuesday of every month. And uh, the next one is March 5th from 10 till 12. If there's um, no further questions, again, my thanks to the presenters. <clears throat> my thanks to everyone who's taken the time today and uh, have a great afternoon. A last call for questions. And if not, I guess we're done. Thank you very much, everyone.